Hey, remember this guy? He became popular on YouTube for playing Space Oddity by David Bowie from space. Well, his name is actually Commander Hadfield, and he was the first commander of International Space Station that was from Canada. Now, in today's video, we're going to be talking about Canadian space exploration and Canadian space agency in general, because you may have not known, but Canada was actually the third country in space after the Soviet Union and the United States. Welcome to What The Math. And we're going to be using Kerbal's space program to try to recreate some of these satellites and some of the rockets that Canadian Space Agency uh, actually created. Now, Canadian Space Agency itself is not very old. It's only been established in 1990, uh, officially established as a kind of a uh, government body. But before that, for something like 30 years, Canada was actually launching uh, different rockets and different space satellites uh, that were part of its military program as well. And so the origins of this uh, so-called Upper Atmosphere Exploration Program can be actually traced back to 1945, right after the Second World War. And back then, what Canada was doing was launching these uh, so-called Black Bread rockets uh, that kind of looked similar to what you see on the screen, that were essentially sounding rockets, which basically means they were um, exploratory atmosphere rockets that would fly in the suborbital uh, trajectory and collect all kinds of data and then uh, return back to Earth. And these were actually used not just by Canada, but by NASA as well, because they were very, very well made and quite popular. And something like 700 or even 800 of these were launched over their lifetime. And with something like 98% success rate, this actually remains one of the most popular sounding rockets ever built. And some of these rockets could actually reach altitudes of up to 1500 kilometers or something like 1000 miles above, above ground, which basically would put it into the ionosphere where most of these rockets would just do a lot of science and then um, return back to Earth. Which also, of course, puts it in the orbit above the space shuttle and above the International Space Station. So they could actually reach quite a high altitude or possibly even orbit if they wanted. But uh, obviously, this was not their main purpose. And then in 1957, um, scientists from the Canadian Defense Research uh, Telecommunication Establishment, which basically is the equivalent of early NASA, but obviously in Canada, started to work on a different kind of a project. They actually started to make their first satellite. And uh, the code name for the satellite was Alouette 1, which is basically French for Skylark, which is, uh, of course, a type of a bird that you see on the screen right now. And the actual satellite looked like like this. So it was a really interesting design, but obviously nothing original, nothing innovative. But for Canada in 1962, and this is when this uh, satellite was actually launched, this was quite an achievement. And so, as I mentioned before, uh, after the Soviet Union and after uh, the United States, in 1962, Canada was the third country in the world to actually launch its own satellite. Now, this is, of course, not 100% accurate because Canada did cooperate with NASA and used uh, a NASA rocket or NASA-built Delta rocket that basically launched the satellite into its orbit. But nevertheless, they did make their own satellite and they were able to basically become the third country in the world to put an artificial satellite into space. And what's really, really unusual, or I guess impressive about this particular satellite is that it had some incredibly excellent technical uh, capabilities. It actually lasted for 10 years instead of expected one year and ended up doing some amazing, crazy research, including ionosphere research, which was actually not planned to begin with. And because of this outstanding achievement, uh, Canada actually became one of the most respected countries uh, in back in those years and later uh, cooperated with various countries, including Russia, actually, to try to create various satellites and various rockets as well. Now, the actual satellite um, was launched from the United States, specifically uh, from the Pacific Missile Range in California. And so technically, it wasn't really launched from Canada because Canada doesn't have any launching platforms. But since the satellite was put in quite a, a high altitude, orbit, specifically here we're talking about almost a thousand kilometers um, of both periapsis and apoapsis, uh, this means that the satellite is still out there, it's still actually orbiting our planet, even though technically it has actually been switched off after 10 years of operation. 
And according to recent estimates, it's uh, expected to stay in orbit for at least another 1,000 years. And so if one day Canada goes back for some sort of historical mission, it may actually decide to bring it back or at least take, uh, take a picture of this beautiful satellite that is still out there. And the actual mission for this satellite was uh, uh, actually fourfold. There were four scientific experiments it was trying to perform, and all of them were based on receiving various electromagnetic impulses from space uh, on various frequencies and then analyzing them and sending uh, them back to Earth. So you actually studied uh, the cosmic radio noise, it studied the very low frequency radiation in space, it also studied high energy radiation using Geiger counters, and finally it also measured the electron density of the ion atmosphere uh, using its sweep frequency sounder. So there's a lot of experimental data that uh, this satellite was able to provide uh, within 10 years that it was in space. And following uh, the Alouette 1 uh, satellite, Alouette 2 was actually also put in a very similar orbit uh, in about three years after the launch. And this is the point when uh, United States actually started to cooperate actively with Canada and the next two satellites were put into orbit and basically used co-jointly with the Canadians, and these satellites were ironically called ISIS. Specifically here we're talking about ISIS-1 and ISIS-2, and uh, ISIS in this case stands for International Satellites for Ionospheric Studies. And both of these satellites uh, stayed in orbit and were actually used for close to 30 years. And then uh, Canada actually put quite a lot of other satellites into space. There was a satellite called Hermes, which was the experimental communication satellite uh, that was unfortunately only used for three years. There was another Another satellite called RadarSat, which was the Earth observation satellite that was used for something like 20 years. And um, every other satellite that was put into orbit uh, since then, specifically uh, starting with MOST, also known as MOST, which is actually a Canadian space telescope, all of the other satellites are still in use today. And what's unusual about Canadian space exploration is that, or I guess that's, that's kind of common for Canada, is that only uh, one of these satellites was used for military use. Uh, Specifically, I'm talking about Sapphire, which was actually launched into orbit only in uh, 2013. So for me, this is about three years ago. And Sapphire was the first military satellite to be used by Canada. And um, even now, we actually think it was probably a bad idea because it's not particularly useful. And all of the other Canadian satellites were actually for strictly scientific use or commercial use as well. And another unusually cool thing about Canadian Space uh, Agency, or I guess the early Canadian Space Agency, is that um, with the launch of ANIC satellite, and ANIC was the series of geostationary communication satellites, and, and the word ANIC itself means little brother in um, Inuktitut, which is one of the official languages of the Northern Territories in Canada. And uh, anyway, so the, these satellites uh, became the first in the world to become geostationary communication satellites. And uh, using ANIC satellites, Canada was able to show that it's possible to essentially establish a communication network for any country using these geostationary satellites that would basically be always placed above a certain point above Earth. And this way you could actually establish uh, really awesome TV channels, which we have today. And obviously all of our cell phones and all our uh, mobile networks use them for communication as well. And one of the reasons why ANIC satellites were even launched was because uh, Canadian broadcasting uh, corporation, CBC, actually wanted to be able to reach the northern parts of Canada, and this allowed them to broadcast all of the uh, TV channels, even though technically they weren't really that good, and that's probably one of the weaknesses of Canada is that our TV is not very good. But anyway, they were actually able to finally reach the northern Canada and uh, transmit all of the channels to the uh, really remote locations in North Canada. And here specifically we're talking about 12 amazing color TV channels, which allowed uh, some of the remote communities in the north to finally watch TV. And actually, ANIC satellites are still in existence today, and the last one was launched in 2013, and this was called ANIC G1, uh, which was actually still launched for the same purpose, to deliver more TV services to various locations around the world. And here specifically, we're talking about providing direct to home uh, television to uh, even countries in South America. And this is actually really interesting because ANIC satellites uh, are probably some of the more successful commercial uh, TV satellites that have been in existence for a very, very long time.
And I think this kind of actually defines Canadian Space Agency uh, really well. Uh, most of the missions were peaceful. Most, most of the missions were meant to either provide the telecommunication to remote communities or to basically explore and discover new things about space and the universe. And really only one of the satellites was essentially a military satellite. And even that satellite called Sapphire was actually only used for monitoring space debris and uh, various satellites within orbit and not really anything malicious or dangerous. And I think personally think that the best representation of Canadian Space Agency is, of course, in its official coat of arms. Its, its logo is essentially this. It's a space horse. Yes, that's right. It is probably the coolest and the most unusual space logo you'll actually see in any of the countries. And this kind of gives you an idea of what a Canadian Space Agency is like. It's all about being peaceful and exploring the universe. And anyway, so I think uh, this is all I wanted to say about Canadian Space Agency and the history of space exploration from the perspective of a Canadian. Now hopefully you enjoyed this video and if you did don't forget to subscribe and don't forget to share this video with some other friends or family that you think may like space videos and learn more about space in general. And if you are a Canadian or if you know something else about Canadian Space Agency or Canadian Space Exploration, please post it in the comments below. And as always, thank you so much for watching, like this video if you've enjoyed this and game you later, see you in the next video and bye bye.